Howdy folks, welcome back to Nomad Boat Building. So over on my Patreon page, I've started a new series where I'm doing a repair job on a Bulger-designed black skimmer for one of my patrons. Now, his trouble didn't start when he started digging into his boat. His trouble started before he purchased that boat by purchasing it without having it surveyed. So I thought it would be helpful to share with all of you the things that you need to consider when purchasing a boat. That is, how do you do a self-survey of a boat? So this is just sort of a, a short, brief outline, but I think it will be helpful to you. Let's get right into it. And when you're buying a small wooden boat, the chances are very, very good you will not be getting a professional surveyor in. So I think it's good to have a good game plan for what you're looking for when you are looking at a small wooden boat. Now I'll come back to hiring surveyors later on in the video, but for now, let's just touch on the basics. So when I go to see a wooden boat for the first time, it might be one that I want to acquire for myself or sometimes somebody asks me to have a look at a boat for them. The first thing I do is I just have a look at the condition that that boat is presented in. Is the cover still on it for one? Has the owner even bothered to sort of taken that cover off and had a look inside in recent history? And if they have, I take a look inside and is it in an orderly shape? Did they leave a bunch of junk lying around inside? or have they taken the time to actually clean it out? Especially you're looking for whether or not there's debris and stuff that is piled up inside of the boat. And of course, standing water is not a good sign either. So that's just the first thing, the first general impression of whether or not we're dealing with an owner who's been conscientious about storing their boat properly. So next we just wanna look at the overall condition of the boat, sort of stand back a moment. And we're looking for what kind of shape is the paint in? Now, if a person is selling their boat, there's every chance they just haven't had time to deal with it anymore. And so the paint and varnish might not be up to snuff, but that's not a deal killer. So what we're just looking for is whether or not the paint has been let go really badly or whether it's just been one or two seasons since it last got a refresh. So we're looking for where paint or varnish is worn through to bare wood. And if so, how weathered is that wood where it's worn through? And then we're also looking for signs that there's trouble lurking underneath paint or varnish. So under paint, we're looking for bubbling, for instance. If the paint is blistering off the surface of the wood, there might be some trouble lying underneath there. And with varnish, we're looking for discoloration of the varnish itself. So if it's looking particularly white or flaky or pale, that's probably a sign that it's well worn out and probably needs to be taken back to bare wood. Varnish that is probably in good shape and can get re-varnished probably just looks dull, but for the most part, the color of the varnish looks okay. We're not seeing any discoloration underneath. And of course, since we're looking at varnish, we're looking for signs of trouble under the varnish in the form of dark wood. So when we see dark or black spots, sometimes that's a sign of rotten wood. Sometimes if there's mechanical fasteners, steel fasteners, that's going to register as black. So if you see a, a plugged hole, for instance, and there's black emanating from it, that's a good sign that there's a steel fastener under there. And what happens is the tannins from the wood react with the iron oxide and it turns it black. Now you've probably seen a lot of videos of people who are ebonizing wood using steel wool and vinegar. It's pretty much the exact same thing that's going on, but is a natural occurrence of it. Now that's not necessarily a deal killer either. That just means if you're wanting to take something apart, you might have a little bit of a struggle with those fasteners. But if you're just worried about the aesthetics of it, you might be able to fix that black staining using oxalic acid. Doesn't always work. It doesn't always work perfectly, but it often works reasonably well, depending on how bad the staining is and the species of wood that it's on. Next thing we're looking for is if this boat looks really freshly painted, that might mean it's an owner who's motivated to sell, but it also might mean it's a mo owner who's too motivated to sell and they've tried to do a, uh, like a used car's, car salesman um, detailing job. So you wanna look really closely at a boat that looks too freshly painted. And this is especially where you're looking for signs of bubbling or signs that someone has been patching something up with some sort of putty or epoxy or something like that. And the places to look for those is especially along the edge of the transom and along the edge of the stem where the planking meets those places. And probably up on the deck where the stem and deck come together. We're always looking for 
corners and connections. I'll remind you of that later too. Corners and connections are where all the trouble usually starts. So of course, if this boat has got a deck and any sort of top sides, a cabin or anything like that, we're looking for all the nooks and crannies where standing water could sit or dirt could sit. So perhaps where the, um, the combings meet the cabin side, sometimes there's little spots in there, any place that there's trim coming to corners, those could be bad spots that we're looking for as well. What kind of surface does the deck have? Is it a finished deck in that it's varnished with caulking? Is that caulking starting to peel up? Or is it a canvas deck or a fiberglass over deck? And of course, we're looking for signs that something's a bit awry there too. If it's a fiberglass deck or a canvas deck, we're looking for spots that have been worn through. Now, as you're looking at your boat, you need to be thinking about the kind of construction that it has and the kind of construction it has is going to influence the kinds of things you're looking for, of course. So if it's a Carville built boat, for instance, that is a plank on frame boat that where the planks are smooth all across their surface and they've got cocked joints. We're looking for whether or not those joints are bulging a little bit, like spitting out the caulking in between them a little bit. It could be not that, not that you necessarily see caulking coming out, but maybe you just see the seam putty is kind of bulging a bit. That might be an indication that those planks are working too hard and it's starting to push the caulking back out. And if the planks are working too hard, it probably means that the fasteners holding the planks are not doing their job. So it could be the fasteners are wearing out, could be their hold on the frames underneath are not very good, or it could be that the frames underneath are starting to have some problems with rot or fracturing, causing those fasteners to not hang in very well. And while we're at it, we're also looking for blistering around those fasteners. So you might see a bulge in the paint where the fastener is. That could be an indication of, again, a fastener letting go, or it could be an indication of an iron fastener that is starting to rust and the rust is expanding and causing that paint to blister. Now you want to be making both mental notes and physical notes about these things as you're looking at them. And of course, take some photographs while you're at it. Be careful not to go and start bad-mouthing the boat. Most boat owners are particularly fond of their boats, of course, and if you have any sort of drastic modifications in mind for making it your perfect boat, certainly keep your mouth shut about that, because again, owners may not want to see their boat getting carved up by somebody else. So just some mild compliments about what a nice boat it is, maybe try and dug into the history a little bit without getting too long a conversation started and then get on with your survey. Now, if you can ask the owner to sort of give you some time with the boat alone, that's the best because the last thing you really want is someone breathing down your neck while you're trying to focus on the details. Okay, now we're gonna get into the boat, how this boat has gone together and whether or not there's some problems lying around. Now, the thing you need to remember first is that this is not your boat. You don't own it, it belongs to someone else. So we want to avoid doing any damage to it. So you're gonna be armed with a few tools, a light hammer, such as this is a good, a good choice. You're gonna want an awl, such as this, or even better, sometimes it's just a little putty knife like this. And we're gonna use these things to try and test what kind of condition the boat's in. So the hammer you're mostly gonna be using outside, and you can very gently, and when I say gently, I mean with the kind of force your doctor might use to check the, uh, the reflexes on your knees, for instance. We're just gonna gently be tapping and all the places that there are connections. So where the planking meets the transom, where the transom has some framing, where the planking meets the stem, where planking meets bulkheads, all these sort of major connection areas. We're, li we're listening for a change from a sharp sound to sort of a soft, duller sound. Now, as soon as you get from where a plank is lying on a bulkhead to where a plank isn't on a bulkhead, there's gonna be a change in sound, guaranteed. But we're listening while we're on that bulkhead for a change from, you know, a good sharp sound to suddenly a more muffled da, 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 that might indicate that the fastenings are letting go in that area or that the wood is rotten in that area and it's just, there's no resonance left to the wood because nice, good wood, it's gonna have a nice ring to it so the reason we're using the hammer is because we can't necessarily see everything. So the hammer is giving us, allowing us to sort of see with our ears. So you want to do that around the whole boat as much as you can. On deck as well, just kind of look for spots up in the neck, up in the corners and things like that where 
you, things ought to be solid and you're listening for those dull spots. Now it doesn't necessarily 100% mean that you found problems when you found a dull spot, but it's something to sort of tuck away in your mind and do some further investigations when you get inside the boat. So now once we're inside the boat, we want to dig deep into the bowels. Again, we are looking for connection points and we're looking for corners. Any place that rainwater might come in and any place that that rainwater might settle. So up at the stem, we're going to be probing very gently up in the breast hook area and down around the heel of the stem probably. Of course, you can go in there with your hammer again and sort of just tapping on the face of the stem to see if you can hear it being sounding hard or soft. And then when it comes to your tools, we don't want to poke holes all over the place. But when you've got a joint, you can very gently sort of probe that joint. You're not trying to jam this thing right through. We're just having a probe preferably into the surface of the wood inside the joint, not the joint itself, because if it's a joint, of course, your thing's going to pass through, especially if it's open. An open joint's not a great sign, but sometimes it's still there and it doesn't mean it's a deal killer. But we're trying to probe for bad wood just inside that joint. All those places that water can seep in and oxygen gets in a little bit, but the water can't get out. Let's remember that rot requires a combination of a certain, certain temperature range, and it's usually somewhere around between 50 degrees-ish and up to, once you start hitting 100 degrees, things are getting too hot for, for fungal activity. And then we're looking for moisture. And fully saturated wood doesn't rot because it's just not enough oxygen that can get into it, usually. But there's a range where wood is not fully saturated that moisture can cause rot. So we've got temperature, we've got moisture, and then we've got food. Well, food is the wood itself. That's one of the reasons we're looking for woods that are very durable and rot resistant. And so a lot of tropical hardwoods tend to be good and durable and rot resistant. White oak is. And where oak is concerned, we have red oak and white oak. White oak is the preferred. You will find red oak on boats, but it's not great because it sucks up water like a sponge. Still, it's around and you will see it. Uh, our uh, cedars are very rot resistant. Pines, pines are okay, but some woods that are less so. Spruce is not so great, even though we see it in boats a lot. It has a very high strength to weight ratio, which is why we see it in boats. And then you want to look for if anybody's been using like things like cherry and walnut and stuff like that. We don't see that on boats very often because they're not really great durable woods compared to the uh, more common ones. Okay, so when we're looking for rot, we're looking for discoloration. We're looking for uh, signs of mildew. So if it's the inside of the boat is painted white, for instance, and you see uh, joints in some, uh, some portions of the boat, say it's between deck planks or whatever, and you, we're looking for mildew emanating from those joints, indicating that there's moisture sitting in those joints. We're also looking for blistering paint, of course, and if the wood is bare and exposed, we're looking for discoloration, which can sometimes appear as a dark blackened color, or it can sometimes appear as a whitish color too. Now, here's one tip I'll give you, and that is most LED lights that are set at a very um, bright white color spectrum up in like the 6500 range are not good for seeing rotten wood. They're not good at seeing discoloration. They tend to bleach it all out in visually. So you're better off with an incandescent light. I use a mag light most of the time. Or if you have a LED light where you can turn the temperature down to the 3500 to 4000 range, I suppose at the brightest, that's probably pretty good. Any brighter than that, I swear to God, it just it's practically invisible. So when we're probing for rot, when wood feels good, it should be, feel firm, like a hard, good aged cheese, like a Jarlsberg or something like that. Even softer woods should feel fairly firm. But if it's rotten, your tool will probably poke into it like you're hitting some feta cheese or a room temperature Havarti, something like that. And that's about the best analogy I can give you because the only way to figure out what rotten wood feels like is to take a tool and go out and probe around for rotten wood. Go into the forest, find some logs, and poke around at them and try and feel the difference between spots that are obviously rotten 
and spots that are obviously good and maybe see if you can find some spots in between that are a bit marginal and try and train yourself to feel the difference. Usually rotten wood will be very weak across its grain and so if you pick at the grain sideways it'll break away pretty easily whereas firm wood that isn't rotten has a good strong grain and it's not going to let you do that. So while we're inside the boat we're also looking at the frames. We want to have a good look at where the frames connect up near the shear and we want to have a good look at where the frames connect up by the keel. Down by the keel we're looking for rot. Up near the frame heads we're probably looking for rot there too because sometimes they pass right through to the deck. And then we're looking around the turn of the bilge where we have longitudinal structure such as bilge clamps or thwart risers, that sort of thing. In those areas we're looking for fractures of the frames because those are hard spots that the frames hit and those tend to be the spots that they suffer the most strain. So at the turn of the bilge we'll sometimes see frames that are fractured or broken and if you're looking, if you see sistered frames, that means someone has bent in another piece of framing alongside of it or over top of it, that's a sign that there was some issues with this earlier on. We really don't want boats with sistered frames. Yes, you can sister a frame to fix a broken frame. That's absolutely doable. It gets done all the time. I don't love it. Now, a sistered frame isn't a deal killer, but it means that if you ever want to restore this boat, you're going to be pulling those sisters out and you're going to have to fix all the fastenings that held that sister in and then of course replace the frame that that sister was sistering. So while we're checking the inside remember we're checking for corners, we're looking up near the stem, we're looking at the frame and keel and gunnel connections and we're also want to take a good look around the transom because that's usually the primary place that water will sit if a boat's sitting on a trailer and they've managed to actually tip it up properly. So down around the corners of the transom but also up in the corners of the transom too because that can also be a trouble spot. So the corners of a transom sometimes there's structural members in there we call fashion pieces and those can be compromised. I've had those rotted out on all kinds of different boats. So you'd be probing up underneath the quarter knees. Now you might not be able to see up there very well so that's one of the few times I'll say take your awl and just very gently poke around a little bit in those corners see if you can feel for some some wood that's not so great okay but let's try not to poke the boat full of holes shall we and likewise if you're using your putty knife we want to go with the grain just use the corner of it and gently probe with the grain so we're not leaving any any you don't want to go cross grain leaving any big cross grain marks because that's not very nice we want to walk away from that boat without any evidence that we've been poking around in there preferably so another thing we're going to be looking for inside are signs of electrolytic decay and so that's when you have electrolytic salts building up usually around parts that are subject to open salt water and that could be from uh, electronics in the boat or electrics in the boat that are allowing a stray current into the bilge water or it could be from stray currents that were in the water surrounding the boat wherever it was living. This stuff will show up as sort of this funny white powdery or cheesy looking um, aura around usually like major fastenings like keel bolts and things like that and through hulls. And sometimes those will be squishy like cream cheese or cottage cheese. Not good stuff. Now if it isn't too severe you can neutralize it with vinegar but in many cases you still need to do repairs where that's occurred because it really breaks down the lignans of the wood and they start to lose their structure very very quickly when that happens. And when you go to repair those, the first thing you do is you get the hardware out, you neutralize that area with your vinegar, and it might have to wait a couple of weeks of, with repeated vinegarings in order to sort of get that activity to stop and to have that wood kind of solidify to, until you get to the point where you could actually do some work on it and have it dry out. Because until then, it's like trying to scarf pudding. Once you're done with all of that, You've taken notes, you've taken photographs of all the things that you think are problematic. If you can take some little voice memos while you're at it, that's great too. Of course, some video doesn't hurt. And when you get back out of the boat, let's take another big step away and just have a look at the general shape again. Because now you've sort of looked at all the little details and, and it's time to sort of back off a little bit. 
And now we're looking for some major signs of misshapenness. So we're looking for hogging. And that means that the bow and stern of the boat are drooping down relative to the middle of the boat. Or we see the, the shear is flattened out when it clearly looks like it should be sweeping up. And of course the bottom too, is it drooping down somewhere? Has it been supported properly by uh, props in its storage? Or is it all kind of got a big bulge where a prop is sitting and it's sagging down all around it? Those are not good signs. And of course, go around to the front or back end of the boat and see if you can see any twist. You know, look at the transom and look at the stem. See if you can notice any twist or even bring a, a, a level with you and just pop it on top of the transom. See what does it look like relative to level. It might not be propped up level, but you can get an idea where the spirit bubble sits. And then go over to the transom, do the same thing and see if that spirit bubble is kind of kicked off to the same side at about the same distance. That's a good way to check for twist as well. Now, if everything looks good and you want to make a deal, I would say it's a good idea to say, I like it, I want to go home and sleep on it. And do that. Go home and sleep on it. And when you come back the next day, or you come back for your next visit, maybe give it all the once over again. Take another few minutes to dig back in there. Make sure you weren't glazed over with excitement and you can see something a little bit uglier. And if everything still looks good and you're not experienced in woodworking and the ways of rotten wood, I strongly consider then looking into a survey by someone else. Now, if it's a small boat that's not worth a ton of money, say like anything under 10 grand, you're not going to get a professional surveyor in very easily. They're, they're busy and they're expensive. Right? You're going to spend five to a thousand bucks on a survey probably. But maybe you can find someone like myself, a small boat builder, or even someone who builds larger boats that you could hire for just an hour or two for a couple of hundred bucks to come and have a look at that boat and get their opinion. Because they're going to see some stuff that you didn't. Now, if you are getting into a larger boat, any boat that's going to need insurance for moorage, I 100% think you should go out and get a professional survey. Once you want to put it in the water and tie it up to a dock somewhere, they will probably want insurance. And any good insurance company is going to want a survey anyway. Beat them to the punch. Get Make sure you get a professional survey to start with. The insurance company may not accept that survey, but at least you know it's been done. And hopefully if it was a nice clean survey, the next surveyor you have to get in will give you a clean slate. And maybe if you're lucky, your insurance company will allow you to use that same surveyor to come and have a look at it again. Who knows? Now I can't speak to value on boats because there's, there's no benchmark for the value of a boat. It's impossible to say a boat's worth this, that, or the other. It depends on what the owner wants for it. It depends on what you're willing to pay for it. And these things are usually completely separated from whatever it costs to build the boat or whatever it will cost to repair the boat. You're on your own for that. But all I would say is have a good look at what other people are asking for similar boats. Try and get an idea. It may not be a very good benchmark that you get. So take that with a grain of salt. So I hope those tips will help you make a good decision in your boat purchasing. Surveying is an important aspect of buying a boat and you might as well do it yourself because you're the one who's going to be paying for that boat and dealing with the repercussions of a bad survey. So let's not be the person making the bad survey. Try and leave emotion out of it. I know it's really tough, but it's really important that you do that. And when it comes to making a deal, consider striking the deal and then going and sleeping on it again. If you've walked away after doing your survey and someone comes along and scoops the boat out from under you or the owner tries to pressure you to come in and make an offer because someone else is coming to look at the boat, let it go. If the boat does go, you can go back to that owner and you can say, please pass on my contact info to the purchaser of that boat and maybe you will be interested in buying it down the road. That's the best I can suggest for that. But high pressure sales of a used boat is a real warning sign that someone is desperate to get rid of it. Now, maybe they're just desperate to get it sold and you can capitalize on that and make a smoking deal. But um, 
I'm not going to comment on that because that really depends on you and the owner and how you both feel about each other and whether or not there is a fair price set on the boat in the first place. I hope all that's been helpful to you. I hope that helps you make the right decisions. I'm going to write up a short little uh, one or two page checklist related to this little conversation we've had and maybe you can take that with you to remind you what you need to look at when you go look at a boat yourself. Now if you're interested in this repair series you can join us over on Patreon. You can get access to the site for the first week for free and thereafter you have to join one of the tiers. Now I will probably release these repair videos onto my YouTube channel at a later date but for the time being they're just going to be exclusive to Patreon now I had one commenter on the last video complain about my having a two-tier system, one for the patrons and one for the general public, and that's really not the case. I've made virtually everything I've produced available to the general public, but my patrons have been very kind and very loyal, and they deserve a little something extra, so at the very least they're getting a first kick at the can for this series. I don't think that's too much to ask, and I'm not asking a lot to join Patreon. The lowest tier is only $3 a month and you get full access to the site. Okay, catch you later, folks.